Let's finish up blood disorders. We looked at thromboembolytic disorders before. That's where you're making too many clots. Now let's look at bleeding disorders. You're not making enough clots. So one, thrombocytopenia. And just from the name, again, you should be able to figure out what that means. Remember, penia, not enough of. Thrombo, remember, we don't actually have thrombocytes, but that's often a term used to refer to platelets. So thrombocytopenia means a deficient number of circulating platelets. So you can't form the platelet plug as easily. You can't plug up a vessel that's been injured. Um, patechias appear due to spontaneous widespread hemorrhage. Patechia are those little red spots all over the place, all right? So what's happening is you're having tiny little hemorrhages here and there. I mean, as you go through the day, you know, you're always bumping into things. You don't realize that you may have ruptured a tiny little capillary someplace. That's because your body normally heals it right away, fixes it. Um, but here, if you don't have enough platelets, you can't fix it. Um, due to suppression or destruction of bone marrow, so malignancy, radiation, that's one possible cause. Um, treat it with um, transfusions of platelets. You simply inject people or transfuse them with platelets, all right? And again, you know, if you, un, untreated, you see a picture of a massive stroke there. Um, if you can't uh, form platelets, um, you know, just all kinds of little things. Normally, blood vessels just get ruptured all the time. Remember how the red blood cells can barely squeeze through the capillaries? Things are just going to happen. You need platelets. You need platelets all the time, even if you're not aware that you need them. Lack of platelets is potentially serious. Okay, so uh, liver dysfunction again. We talked about liver dysfunction way back earlier when we talked about ascites and quashier core. Remember liver, again, the plasma protein factory of your body making all those plasma proteins. So if you have liver disease, um, you're not making, so remember liver's making all those, the prothrombin and the fibrinogen and all that kind of stuff. So without liver disease, you're not making the components you need in order to um, clot your blood. So impaired liver function, inability to synthesize procoagulants, Causes include vitamin K deficiency, um, hepatitis, cirrhosis. People with hepatitis and cirrhosis in big trouble in lots of ways. Your liver does so many things for you that you may not even realize. Be good to your liver, kids. Liver disorders are not a pleasant thing to have happen to you. Liver disease can also prevent liver from producing bile, impairing fat, and vitamin K uh, absorption. So, oh my God, take care of your liver. Cirrhosis of the liver, you see in the illustration there. What happens when your liver becomes damaged, it starts producing these nodules, but that's non-functional tissue. So your liver um, will increase in size, um, but um, it's not as functional anymore. So that's why the, another thing you'll see, uh, chronic alcoholics, cirrhosis of the liver. When you see them, they have those big giant beer bellies. Part of that is from their enlarged liver. Part of that is from the fact that their liver can't make enough proteins and therefore they get ascites. So yeah, that massive beer belly, often a sign of some severe liver disease. So bleeding disorders, hemophilia, you've probably heard of this before. Several similar hereditary bleeding disorders. Hemophilia A is the most common type due to a defect in factor eight. So remember um, back earlier when we looked at the clotting cascade, I told you you didn't have to know that, but remember there are like 13 clotting factors and all those clotting factors are necessary in order for you to form blood clots. If you're missing any factor, then basically that component of the whole cascade is dysfunctional. You can't do it. And therefore, everywhere downstream from that missing factor doesn't work. So that's what's going on here. Hemophilia, hemophilia B, deficiency of factor 9. Hemophilia C, a mild type, deficiency of factor 11. So there you go. Just different uh, missing clotting factors means you can't clot blood. Those are different kinds of hemophilia. Symptoms include prolonged bleeding, especially into the joint cavities. So like you see that little kid's arm there. Um, you know, all day long, we're always, you know, bumping into things. I mean, all humans are essentially clumsy. Um, and normally you don't know it because your body immediately fixes it. But if you have hemophilia, a little thing like that, just bumping your elbow on the table, next thing you know, you've got massive bleeding inside. 
Treatment with uh, plasma transfusions and injection of missing factors. A woman in my class a few years back, one of her kids had one of the types of hemophilia. I don't remember which one. But the kid just went in periodically and got um, injections of um, missing clotting factors so that that kid would not be have all the bleeding problems. And hemophilia, you may know, ran in uh, some of the royal families in Europe. Um, what happens when you breed with relatives once you get the bad gene in there and you start having sex with other members of your family, then that gene just keeps getting moved on down the line. So several royal families had uh, hemophilia throughout their family. All right, transfusion reactions. Here is another problem here that we've already talked about a little bit. Let's go into it a little more. This will occur, of course, if mismatched blood is infused. Um, the donor cells are attacked by the recipient's plasma agglutinins. Those are the antibodies. So remember, if you have type A blood, you have B anti-B antibodies. So if you have type A blood and you've you got a transfusion from either B or AB, all right, then the anti-B antibodies in your blood are going to attack the blood cells of a B or an AB donor. And now you get clumping together. So you get the, the blood cells all connected by antibodies, and now we're in trouble. They agglutinate, they clog small vessels, that ruptures and releases free hemoglobin into the bloodstream, and now we're getting serious here. Because remember, iron is very toxic. You can't let iron travel by itself through the blood. Normally you want transferrin to transport it. So this is serious, all right? Consequences, diminished oxygen carrying capacity, because, you know, you don't have enough functional red blood cells now. The blood is not getting to your tissues. Hemoglobin in the blood may result in renal failure. So hemoglobin is a huge, giant molecule. It's not ever supposed to be by itself in the blood. And your kidney, which filters your blood, is not prepared to handle something like that. So when hemoglobin starts coming downstream and hits the kidneys, kidneys just start blowing out. We'll see later when we look at the urinary system, you have little things called nephrons, little functional structures, and you start blowing out nephrons, and yeah, your kidneys start failing. So here, this lower right illustration, I took this from a nursing book or a nursing website, blood transfusion reaction, okay. So there you see, number one, assessment. The nurse arrives and quickly assesses the situation as a blood transfusion reaction. So immediately, blood tubing is disconnected and saved for lab evaluation. Yeah, somebody's going to pay the price here. Uh, then number two, normal saline intervention. IV clamps are turned off. Blood transfusion stopped. Normal saline hung using new IV tubing. You don't want the old tubing because it might have some, some of the blood in it. Vital signs, O2 sat, lung sounds checked. Documentation is done. Yeah, you're going to pay. You're going to pay for it. And then MD notified number three. Yeah, blood transfusion reactions are extremely serious. I had a girl in my class a few years back. She was a transporter for blood um, from like between different hospitals and stuff like that and clinics. She like drove the van and delivered blood. She said there were like nine people that had to sign off on that along the way. Everybody who touched that bag had to sign off saying, yes, this is my name and I am acknowledging that this is type AB negative blood. And by God, when there was a transfusion reaction, they traced back through all those signed documents, and somebody paid for it. Hemolytic disease with a newborn. This is very interesting. And we talked about this back when we um, talked about different blood types. Remember, there's the ABO, and then there's the RH. All right. So remember, what was the rule about RH transfusions? Do you remember what was going on with that? So people who are RH um, positive, of course, they can't have any antibodies against the RH factor, otherwise they would attack their own blood. But we said that people who are RH negative don't normally make antibodies, all right, until they're exposed to RH positive blood. So the first time is okay, but every subsequent time there's the potential for a reaction, all right? So hemolytic disease with a newborn, HDN, also called erythroblastosis fetalis. What happens is an RH negative mother becomes sensitized with it when exposed to RH positive blood. That causes her body to make anti-RH antibodies. 
so she's now got antibodies against RH. Well, what happens if she has a baby who is RH positive, all right? Because again, the genetics are such that two parents can have either one. So if mom has got anti-RH um, antibodies and she's carrying a baby that's RH positive, then what's going to happen is her own antibodies are going to cross the placenta and destroy the red blood cells of an RH positive baby. Mom is basically going to end up killing or severely making sick her unborn fetus. So this is a big deal. It's a great illustration on the left. You can see there's uh, two people. Oh, look, the woman's got her hand on his shoulder. She's leaning her head in. This is how trouble starts. This is how it all starts. Rh negative woman with Rh positive fetus. Cells from Rh positive fetus enter woman's bloodstream. Woman becomes so this can happen. This is the first pregnancy. All right. What can happen is that some of the fetuses, um, Rh uh, positive uh, blood cells, can enter the woman's body. The woman then makes antibodies against it, and it's in her next pregnancy that we have trouble. All right. So do you see once again first encounter. Not a big deal. It's the second encounter. So therefore, moms who have had, who are Rh negative, they normally are going to go undergo some testing to make sure that they don't have the anti-Rh antibodies. And if they do, then they take something called Rogam, which is an immune globulin that tries to prevent problems from happening. So this next slide kind of shows that, all right? Baby can be treated with pre-birth transfusions and exchange transfusions after birth. That's if, if it happens and the baby is now affected. Um, a better way is to use the Rogam serum containing anti-RH that prevents the RH negative mother, mother from being sensitized. So you see here um, in the illustration one, the RH negative mother, she's, uh, the baby's blood is crossing. Um, she gets the anti uh, D antibodies, and then second, Rh positive fetus, her antibodies are attacking the baby, all right? So, and I, I the whoever made this illustration, that's just terrible. Look, the woman on the left, she's got nice, cute hairdo. She looks, she looks very, very just like a wonderful, normal woman. And then you see, you know, between pregnancies, look at, by the second pregnancy, look at now, her hair is pushed back got big saggy boobs she's got you know wearing cheap hooker lipstick no no wonder she got pregnant a second time so okay um oral heparin might be prescribed for a patient who what has thrombocytopenia is a hemophiliac has a clotting factor deficiency is at risk for embolism or is anemic which one of those people needs heparin remember what does heparin do Heparin is an anticoagulant. Which of those people needs an anticoagulant? Yeah, somebody who's at risk for embolism, all right? We don't want them making spurious blood clots, so we give them heparin, all right? And early on, we saw that picture of the horrible werewolf thing. That's called lycanthropy. Lycanthropy is werewolfism. Um, it's, it's really funny. Throughout history... Um, all cultures all over the world have, you know, just known that blood is clearly something really important. And there are all these mythologies worldwide about creatures that come after your blood. I mean, it's really funny. No matter where you go on the planet, there's a thing about creatures who come after your blood. So look here. Ancient, you know, like from, you know, Renaissance times or whatever, uh, you got drawings of a werewolf thing, all right? Um, there's a werewolf here, um, werewolf, all right, going after people. I mean, these are old, old, old drawings from hundreds of years ago. Um, there, werewolf, you know, killing all the people. And it's hard to tell exactly what all is going on in that picture. <coughs> there you see. I, I think it preys on uh, the human um, sort of fear that you think you know somebody, but you they're not who you think they are. That's the whole werewolf thing. They're normal most of the time, and then they turn into a werewolf. Here you see, like, you know, a husband who's turned into a werewolf, and now he's killing his children, and so on and so forth. It's it's a it's a very deep fear, I think, of, you know, not really knowing who someone is, and they might turn into someone horrible. 
and it all has to do with blood. Here again, you see a hungry werewolf attacking a victim from a 16th century woodcut. So this is in the 1500s, this is 500 years ago. People are thinking about this stuff. Um, there you see how, you know, women always involved. There you see the mort of the Lucaru, the werewolf, killing a werewolf. Little Red Riding Hood basically ties into the whole werewolf thing, you know, the werewolf coming after her. A lot of uh, variations of the Red Riding Hood story. Yeah. Yeah, sex always involved at some point or another. In every in every mythology, sex has to get involved. Yeah, All right. And um, other places, a lot of Native American mythology as well. You've got these creatures, these combo creatures. Um, here, you know, part raven, part snake, part whatever elk. But uh, oftentimes they come after you for your blood. This is the Wendigo up in the Great Lakes region, a mythology up there about a creature that comes after you and kills you and drinks your blood. These are all Wendigo and things. Sex again, of course, always. Ooh. Yes. Imagine going through the woods at night and seeing one of those. Um... In the Scandinavian countries, they're what are called selkies. They're like these um, mermaid-like creatures, and they emerge. Um, they, they can live in the water, and then they emerge and have human form, and they seduce men and kill them. It's that awesome. Most men, of course, deserve that. So there's a Japanese band named Selkie. And, uh, you know, uh, you got Netflix and stuff, you know, the whole... Vampire, werewolf stuff, it's all kind of the same thing. Um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And Shakira, her song, She-Wolf, right? A domesticated girl, that's all you ask of me. Darling, it is no joke, this is lycanthropy. That's werewolves. So everybody, please, pleasant dreams, okay?